Okay, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Vincent Britz, or Vince for short. Um, I work at Flinix International in a development role and then also in a high-level technical support role. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is some work that I, I was involved in developing, uh, is in adding some new functionality to Flonex with the aim of modeling uh, gas turbine lubrication systems. So I'd just like to talk you through the, the methodology of like what we've added and then also show you uh, a simple demonstration as to how we can go about building these models. Uh, just before we talk about the, the technical details, these are just a couple of applications or uses that I see for this type of model. Um, the first of which being um, the sizing of oil scavenge lines. So not only just deciding on the diameter, um, the diameter in this case uh, shouldn't be too small because the uh, required oil flow rate will correspond to a particular um, cooling load. And then along with that, if the, the pipe is too small, you would not be able to achieve that cooling flow rate. And if the pipe is too large, you could be uh, wasting precious space in your, your gas turbine engine. So sizing that line is important, but then also above and beyond that, um, determining whether or not it's sufficient to have that line uh, configured as a gravity fed line, or whether or not you should be installing a scavenge pump, some kind of positive displacement pump like a gear pump um, in that line to to just create that additional flow inside of that particular line if space is such an issue that the the pipe diameter can't be large enough for a gravity fed flow. Uh, another application would be in uh, analyzing the the air side so these bearing chambers are uh, sealed by air around the shaft itself. Um, in that case, uh, it's important to know the secondary air consumption for the purpose of designing secondary air systems. So working out what that secondary air flow rate will be um, would be a good application. And then also uh, looking at sizing the, the, vent, uh, the vent lines. In the case that you have a, a bearing chamber that uh, has an air vent, um, sizing that vent line is important to ensure that the, um, the level inside of that particular chamber is at the, the value that you would like. Uh, and then the last thing is looking at some startup scenarios. So uh, as with all of our models in Flonex, we have the ability to run steady state as well as transient simulations. So we could look at varying the air supply pressure during the startup of the gas turbine and understanding what effect that has on the oil cooling or the cooling oil flow rates and seeing uh, how the entire system behaves with these varying conditions. Okay, so just to talk briefly about what the uh, latest Linux release this year um, included. So there are a few other things outside of this, but these are the two main sections that are, are related to this webinar. Uh, the first of which is a new fluid type. Uh, it's a liquid gas fluid type. It basically allows us to mix a uh, incompressible liquid with a compressible gas fluid um, and we just specify them as a standard liquid fluid and as a standard gas fluid. There's no need for any complex fluid properties. In the past we've tried to model similar applications where we have a two-phase fluid mixed with a gas. Um, we've had this model, we call it the two-phase incondensable model, We've had this in Flonex for a while now, and we use it for uh, humid air applications. Um, we looked at using it for this particular application, but specifying oil as a two-phase fluid required very detailed two-phase fluid properties for the oil, which really isn't practical. So this fluid was created uh, to basically uh, fulfill that need and allows us to mix just a standard liquid with a, a constant density, for example, or a density that varies with temperature, and then simple specifications for viscosity, conductivity, um, density, and specific heat. Um, and with that, that information, your, your mixture can become fully defined. Uh, to go and actually assist in uh, predicting these pressure drops as accurately as possible, we also added a new two-phase pressure drop correlation to our pipe components. Uh, we added the Beggs and Brill correlation. This correlation allows us to account for the um, pressure drop using a non-homogeneous momentum model. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. 
um, and is uh, widely used in the oil and gas industry for predicting the pressure drop in uh, pipes with two-phase flow. And then secondly, we also added another correlation to our bend components. This is the uh, CRISM model um, and is also used uh, for predicting two-phase pressure drops in bends. Uh, just a little bit of information on this Beggs and Bull correlation. Uh, this is fully documented in the new Flonex release. So if you do have a copy of the software, you can check it out in the Flonex theory manual. Alternatively, if you'd like to know more information, please let me know and I will send that, uh, that entire section onto you um, where you can read through all of the, the details as to how this pressure drop is calculated. Um, in short, basically what this correlation does is it first classifies the fluid into a particular flow regime. Uh, the Beggs and Bull correlation has four different regimes, namely distributed, segregated, intermittent, and transition flow. Um, the regime is determined by looking at the combination of the fruit number and the uh, input liquid content or liquid holdup. Um, this liquid holdup is basically the volume fraction of liquid. Uh, this, once this flow regime has been determined, we're then able to calculate the liquid holdup of the fluid um, or the actual liquid holdup. That input liquid content is considered the homogeneous liquid holdup. So that assumes both velocities are the same. The correlation then uh, uh, corrects this liquid holdup, creating what is called the actual liquid holdup. Um, and this, uh, this is calculated, taking into account the inclination of the pipeline as well. Um, this particular model then also allows us to have separate gas and liquid velocities and provides uh, more accurate pressure drops when you don't have uh, uh, almost equal fractions of liquid and gas. So when you have a pipeline with very little liquid and a lot of gas or vice versa, um, you can have uh, the two phases of very different velocities. So this model then is more accurate in those particular regimes. Okay, um, uh, Flonex itself has many components dedicated to modeling secondary flows. These will be rotating channels, rotating nozzles, uh, cavities where we have uh, two rotating surfaces or cavities where one surface is stationary and the other is rotating. We have components for rotating uh, annular gaps, etc. cetera. Um, and all of these components can be used to model the secondary flow parts in um, these gas turbine engines. Um, and the, the same secondary air that's used here is then used to seal the bearing chambers in our oil lubrication systems. So we can use the flow interface components. You'll see them under the nodes and boundaries section. They're called flow interface primary and flow interface secondary. What that, what that allows us to do is to connect these two uh, networks of different fluid types and just uh, exchange information for pressure, temperature, and mass flow. So it basically ensures uh, mass and energy balance across that boundary and then allows us to uh, connect these two systems with different fluid types. So you can connect your secondary air system directly to your lubrication system instead of having to um, transfer boundary conditions between departments. You could basically set up a secondary air simulation, set up a lubrication simulation, and then connect them with these interface nodes to have Flonex deal with the, the data transfer between the two automatically. Uh, I'll show you this in detail in a second, but this is basically all we need to do to specify our oil mixture. Um, we select the fluid we'd like to use as the gas phase and the fluid we'd like to use as the liquid phase. And then um, Flonex calculates all of the mixture properties uh, under the surface. So we've put a lot of work into things like the mixture densities, mixture viscosities, how each of the components with their typical theory should then use these fluid properties. Um, and yeah, basically the, the, the detailed work regarding this fluid model is all done in the background. From the user point of view, um, you would create your mixed fluid, and then some components will have additional inputs. I mentioned the pipe component has a new pressure drop correlation, so there will be a drop-down list that will allow you to choose the, the uh, old correlation, the lockout martinelli correlation, or to use this new Briggs and Brill correlation. So some components will have new inputs, but most of the time when you're using the new fluid, you won't even see any difference in your component inputs. It's just the underlying fluid theory that's being applied differently. Okay, so let's move across to Flonex and I'll show you what we've got. Um, what we have over here is a, a simple uh, oil sump. Uh, 
we have a shaft in the middle with uh, two lab seals on the left and two lab seals on the right. Um, this inner casing represents the oil sump itself or the, the actual bearing housing. And then around that is the casing which allows us to have our secondary air injected for the purpose of calculating our, um, uh, basically have our secondary air injected uh, for the purpose of sealing our, our bearing housing. Uh, if we look at the internals here, we have our oil entering from the top. Uh, in this case, it's two streams just above each of the bearings. We model the uh, inlet nozzles just with restrictors. Uh, we have our air vent on the left over here also being modeled with a restrictor. Uh, at the bottom, we have our scavenge line. Uh, this here is our pipe component, and this pipe component has this new uh, Beggs and Brill correlation selected. Um, and then uh, just some lab seals to model, as I say, the, the labyrinth seals at the uh, inlets to the bearing housing, and then also the casing that allows us to, to pressurize this cavity with secondary air. Uh, I've used uh, typical values for temperatures and pressures. These are not uh, very accurate values, but they, they're in the, the right area. So um, in uh, imperial units, this is around uh, 600 Fahrenheit and around uh, 21 PSI, 22 PSI. Um, and the flow that we're seeing over here in terms of air is about 331 kilograms per hour. So in pounds per second, that's a 0 0.2, or pounds per minute is 12 pounds per minute there. Uh, on the oil side, we have uh, oil added about one and a half kilograms per second, or about uh, three pounds per second, and then added at a temperature of around uh, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, or 60 degrees Celsius. Okay, so when it comes to actually modeling the interface where we have our oil and air, uh, what I like to do for this particular arrangement is to use the container interface components. Here we're modeling the air in the top container and the, um, the oil in the bottom container. The reason I like to do it like this is firstly because uh, the top container will then have a separate temperature to the bottom container, which means that our air phase will uh, not share the same temperature that our oil phase, so we will be able to still have a difference in temperature, which is important for calculating the correct pressure drop of the outlet here. If we were to use, say, a two-phase tank instead, then the air and oil phases would become the same temperature, and our air leaving would be significantly cooler. It would be as if that air had mixed homogeneously with the oil and then left at the same temperature as the oil. So this way we can maintain our air temperature. Um, also on the container interface component, we see a force imbalance result. So what we've gone and done here is um, uh, varied the pressures inside of these components until we have a zero force imbalance. That basically means that the pressure in the air and the pressure in the oil is the same. Uh, when it comes to building this model, uh, first up would be in deciding on an oil flow rate. That is simply just by specifying a mass, a mass source at the inlet. We then specify our outlet conditions for our oil. Here it's just the pipe, a restrictor, and some uh, pressure at the outlet of this uh, pipeline. This uh, later on will be connected down to a, a scavenge line and ultimately a scavenge pump, but I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, once we have this all set up, we can look at what our oil phase uh, pressure is. So in this case, we see 117 kilopascals. That is around 17 PSI. Uh, what we will then want to do is go ahead and connect that, or rather have the, the air phase pressure now um, made equal to the oil pressure, which would then result in a steady solution. If this wasn't the case, if, for example, the oil phase had a higher pressure than the air phase, we would see the level in the tank increase until the oil flow uh, or until the, the oil pressure had decreased to match the air pressure. Uh, okay, if we carry on, uh, the ways that we can actually achieve this force balance or pressure balance is to ensure that the um, oil flow out is such that the oil, um, either the oil pressure matches the air pressure, or what I think is a better solution is to change the air side to ensure that the air phase 
is at the same pressure as the oil phase. So to do that, we could either change the clearances on our labyrinth seals at the inlet, making those clearances bigger or smaller will change the pressure inside of the cavity, or what I think is a better option is to change the size of the hole at the uh, air vent. By changing that size, we can also change the pressure inside of this cavity. So, uh, for example, if we had a hole of, say, 15 millimeters, that's, uh, if I put that into inches, is roughly uh, 0.6 inches. Uh, that, will, that will result in a force imbalance between the air phase and oil phase. Here we see the oil pressure at 117 kilopascals and the air phase at 114 kilopascals. So in this case, our air phase is a lower pressure and we see a positive force, force imbalance. To overcome this, we could either increase the clearance on our um, labyrinth seals to have less of a pressure drop from our secondary air into our um, bearing housing or bearing, uh, bearing chamber, or alternatively, we could increase the pressure drop at the outlet, basically make this hole smaller. So I think this is a, an easier way to, to achieve the same result. Um, and in terms of design, it should be easier to achieve a smaller hole here rather than uh, changing the clearances on lab seals. So here, if we go ahead and change the size from say 15 to 11 millimeters, we can see our force imbalance is almost zero. Uh, if you wanna get it all the way to zero, you can go ahead and use the designer inside of Flonex. Uh, here we would take the force imbalance results on the container interface component, just drag this into the equality constraints, set the target value as zero, and then uh, drag in the size, the diameter of this outlet uh, or this air vent out, uh, outlet and have Flonex change that size uh, automatically until we see a zero force imbalance. So here I'm just running the designer and after a few iterations, we can see Flonex gets to a diameter where the force imbalance is, is zero newtons. So this would be one way in which we could go about uh, sizing the air system after determining what our uh, desired, uh, or after implementing our desired oil flow rates and then sizing our air system to match that. Um, in this particular example over here, what I've gone and done is implemented a small amount of carryover air into our oil stream. So like I mentioned earlier, oil is in this bottom container and air is in the top container. Um, I haven't connected the restrictor at the outlet directly to the bottom container. Instead, I've used these flow resistance components. They are just, uh, in this case, just connection components. They pose no real pressure drop. They have a very high admittance, so a very low resistance. You can see the pressure drop here is in the order of uh, one times 10 to the minus six or one times 10 to the minus nine kilopascals. So very insignificant in the, the whole system. And um, you can't see it too clearly, but if I highlight it, you can see that there's a data transfer link between these two components. What I've done is connected this flow resistance component from the outlet tank to the restrictor. So this flow will be calculated through the momentum conservation, whereas the flow on this component I have uh, fixed using the fixed mass flow option. By doing this, I'm able to then um, use a data transfer link and specify a particular multiplier or, or a fraction to multiply our uh, mass flow in this uh, oil line by and apply that mass flow in our air. Um, in simple terms, what that does is it takes the oil flow rate, whatever the momentum equation works out the oil flow rate to be, and then multiplies it by a percentage. In this case, I've chosen 0.1% and applies that amount of air into our oil stream. So in this case, it's representing 0.1% of the mass of oil being air in this case. So we'll see our mass fractions at the outlet, or sorry, not 0.1, as 0.3%. So here we see 99.7% oil at our outlet and 3% air at the outlet. This basically gives us a, a way of um, manually adding a small amount of carryover air into our system. Um, it's not the perfect solution. Um, we're still working on uh, developing additional theory to help predict this carryover um, air a bit more accurately. But for now, uh, this is a way of at least accounting for this carryover air in a, um, in a relatively easy to use fashion.
um, until we can have uh, more detailed theory applied in these components. Okay, if we look at the pipe components, I mentioned we have this new Beggs and Brill correlation. Uh, with that, we can see additional results. So we'll see the flow regime that's predicted. If you remember from earlier, there was that flow map determined between the fruit number and no slip liquid holdup. Um, using those two values, we determine the flow regime. In this case, it's intermittent flow. And then from there, we can also determine values like the gas velocity, the liquid velocity, the void fraction, basically the volume fraction of gas, the liquid holdup, which is the volume fraction of liquid, the uh, liquid density, the gas density, etc. So we have this uh, non-homogeneous uh, momentum model inside of the pipe. So we're accounting for separate velocities in our in our two phases. Okay, so if we then move on and go and put this into a, a large system, what I have over here is a, a simple demo for a typical uh, gas turbine lubrication system. We have uh, two, two bearing sumps. I've just chosen two to, to keep the model as simple as possible. We have a uh, oil filter. Uh, we then have the oil flowing through a heat exchanger where the oil is cooled by air. We then have another heat exchanger where the oil is cooled by fuel. Basically, heat is transferred from the oil into the fuel to warm the fuel and cool the air. That oil then flows up through piping, uh, through some uh, last chance strainers, and then into the, the bearing sumps. The first bearing sump over here is pretty much identical to what we had before, um, where we have um, an air vent and a scavenge line, and then the bearing sump on the right-hand side has um, uh, a scavenge line but no air vent. So here we have both oil and air being carried down the pipeline. Uh, these two scavenge lines then flow towards a series of scavenge pumps. So here I've modeled them using the positive displacement pump components. These here just uh, take standard positive displacement pump charts, so uh, volume flow versus uh, speed, and then each of these lines is at a different pressure rise or different pressure differential over our component. Uh, if we then look what happens from here, uh, this uh, oil then flows uh, from the scavenge pumps into the main oil reservoir at the top here. This oil reservoir is also connected to this uh, other uh, oil sump or small oil reservoir where the air is returning from that vent line. If we zoom out a little bit, we can see the air from this first bearing cavity, uh, the air can flow up uh, through this uh, vent line and then through a strainer into a um, another small storage tank and then from there the um, air can pass into this main uh, reservoir just flowing through a check fill first so that there's no return flow in this direction. Uh, we have a small vent to atmosphere modeled over here as well just with a restrictor and a pressure boundary condition and then um, this uh, tank here represents our, our oil reservoir, which is then connected through some more piping into our main uh, oil pump. This here provides the pressure rise needed for uh, overcoming all of the resistances in our oil system, which is primarily our um, oil filter, the heat exchangers, and the uh, inlet nozzles for injection into our bearing chambers. So if we follow the flow from here, it goes through the oil filter, we have a pressure relief system is modeled as well. The, uh, this basically just ensure that we don't have any overpressure in our system. The, the fluid then flows through uh, the uh, piping, through the air heat exchanger to cool the oil, through the fuel heat exchanger to warm the fuel and cool the oil even further, and then straight back up through our last chance strainers and into our, our bearing sumps. Um, here I've used the same approach as before, using the container interface to model the uh, air and oil phases separately, and then using a data transfer link and a fixed mass flow to account for some carry over air into our oil stream and our scavenge line. On the right-hand side, I've just used a two-phase tank. Here we have our oil and air mixing. This two-phase tank basically will do a mass balance uh, between the air and oil phases and ultimately determine what the uh, homogeneous level inside of that tank will be. So here we see the um, homogeneous void fraction being 95.7% air, um, 
which corresponds to about 4.3% liquid inside of this tank. Uh, different values or different combinations of air and oil will result in different homogeneous levels inside of this tank. Uh, this then flows through the series of pipes. Uh, all the way along, we apply elevations to the nodes to correctly account for the, the elevation pressure drops. Um, the Bergs and Brill correlation, as I mentioned earlier, accounts for inclination differences in the pipeline um, and is one of the only correlations that is suited for all inclinations. You will find some two-phase correlations that are ideal for horizontal flow, other ones that are ideal for vertical flow. The Beggs and Brill correlation is, is suited for all inclinations, so it makes it a, an ideal correlation for this particular application. So here we specify our elevations of the nodes along the way, and then um, uh, specifying the, the lengths and diameters of all of our pipelines. Uh, for the pipe components, we've gone ahead and discretized these components. Uh, most importantly, from a discretization point of view, we're looking uh, not so much at the change in fluid properties in, in the sense of, like, say, density or, uh, or perhaps uh, viscosity, but more in the sense of the flow regime inside of the pipeline. Um, as the flow uh, reaches or travels down the, the um, scavenge lines, we have the air phase expanding and our um, as a result, our air velocity uh, will go up and our liquid velocity will go down. Oh, sorry, our liquid velocity will go up as well. Um, and as a result of that, we can have uh, regi regime changes in the lengths of these pipe components. So um, for use with this Beggs and Brill component, we just recommend also incrementing your pipes uh, inside of the scavenge lines. This is just going to help predict that regime change inside of a pipe component instead of just having one regime in one pipe transferring to another regime in another pipe. Um, it's just uh, more accurate to have that regime change in one of these pipe components. Okay, so then once all of this is set up, uh, we can go ahead and solve our network. Um, let me actually talk for the for a second on this uh, on the other, the major pressure drops, uh, we have this oil filter over here, which I've modeled just using a general empirical relationship. You can realistically use any of the custom pressure drop components. Um, here, I'm just using the general empirical relationship um, as a, say, a, a pressure a pressure drop coefficient. Um, and then our heat exchanges here are modeled using the the heat exchanger component in Flonex. So this is allowing us to specify the heat exchange in a very simple fashion using effectiveness. Um, we could also specify this with, say, a, a UA value, um, but ultimately, um, this is just a very crude way of approximating the heat transfer. If you would like some more detail, um, it is also possible to use the heat transfer components. So model it fundamentally using convection and conduction. Um, if you wanted to model the heat exchanger in more detail. But that would obviously require uh, more information regarding the geometry of these particular heat exchangers. Um, but would then give you a much better understanding as to um, the performance of the, the heat exchanger in general. Okay, so once we've gone ahead and solved this network, um, you can see our, our solving times are comparable to, to other Flonex networks. Um, here we're seeing a solving time in about five and a half seconds. Um, I'm using a standard desktop computer here. It's just a, a laptop with a, an i7 processor, a seventh generation, so nothing fancy. Um, we're, we're solving this network with about uh, 190 flow elements and about 190 flow nodes. So 100 and roughly 200 nodes and elements inside of our system. So the number of uh, variables that we're solving for is is not that many, nothing comparable to say 3D CFD, and as a result, we get uh, solution times in around uh, in a in in a matter of seconds. So uh, depending on the size of your network and uh, any other uh, fluids that you may add, for example, if you had a two-phase fluid with natural circulation, you could increase your solving times just due to the complexity of the. Um, the equations that are being solved. So we're typically going to see solving times in the order of, say, one second to 60 seconds, just to be conservative. Uh, when it comes to transient models, we're looking at uh, real-time or close to real-time solution speeds. Once again, depending on the complexity of your model, um, the physics that's at play inside of the system, and then also the time steps that you use. Okay, um, so just to conclude, uh, this new Flonex release uh, has the ability to model liquid gas mixtures. 
So we can connect our liquid fluid to our gas fluid with a simple specification of a liquid and a simple specification of a gas, no requirement, no need for any complex two-phase properties. Um, and this basically allows us to build these uh, lubrication system models, um, which we can then use in steady state and transient. Uh, these lubrication models can be connected to our secondary flow models, so we can actually have the uh, actual inlet pressure for our lubrication model uh, calculated with the secondary air system and have the um, mass flow rates of air consumed by the lubrication system um, calculated by our lubrication model and sent to our secondary air system. So both of these models can be modeled in Flonex and solved simultaneously. Uh, with this functionality, um, it should allow easy sizing of, of pipelines. This will be our our, our scavenge lines, both from a point of view of determining uh, the required diameter for the, the desired flow rate, but then also looking at the effect of gravity-fed pipelines and determining whether or not a scavenge pump will be necessary. Um, we can then also look ahead at um, sizing airlines to ensure that we have pressure balance inside of our bearing cavities and then also sizing pumps as well. In this particular example, I was using the pump components with charts, but realistically, you could just fix the mass flow in a pump component and have Flonex calculate the required pressure rise and volume flow, and then select a relevant pump that matches that performance. Uh, yeah, so, so that's about it in terms of the content. Uh, if you have seen anything here that is uh, of interest to you, or something that you'd like to to, to try out, um, uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, we'd be more than happy to prepare a more specific demo to your company. So if you're looking at using Flonex for your lubrication system models, um, we'd be happy to, to set up a more specific presentation talking to particular points that matter to your uh, your company or your department. Um, and if you would be interested in trying the software, um, we're happy arranging a trial as well. Um, we have resellers in North America who'd be more than happy to uh, to meet with you and chat. But then from a development point of view as well, we're also very involved with our, our clients in terms of adding new functionality. So if there is anything here that you've seen um, and you know uh, particular correlations or particular theory that would enhance these particular models, please feel free to, to send us an email. Um, uh, the, the user feedback is a really strong factor in, in driving development here at Flonex. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, these uh, uh, basically the, the input from, from users in industry um, just strengthens the, the usefulness of the code and ultimately benefits you and your work at the end of the day. Okay, that about brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, thank you for, for your time. As I mentioned, if you do have uh, any questions, uh, feel free to contact us. Um, and then uh, if you do happen to find yourself in Norway at the Turbo Expo next week, um, there is a, a Flonex booth there. Um, some of my colleagues will be across there. And if you would like some more information on this oil lubrication system, or maybe you would like to, to try out the software, um, they'll have Flonex up and running there. And you can, you can chat to them, ask as many questions as you would like, uh, check out some of the models, for example, um, so yeah, if you are there, please uh, stop by. Um, we'd be more than happy to to meet you and to, to talk about some of these applications. Okay, that brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, if you do have any questions, please type them into that questions box, um, and I'd be happy to to answer them.